my name's Lloyd, and I travel the world creating magic tricks for a living. That's exactly the reaction I was expecting. You all just <laughs> looked like you walked in on your dog sitting on the toilet, like, what is going on there? I'm going to talk to you about three things today. First of all, a little bit about, about what I do, because I always get the same questions. Secondly, how I ended up doing it. And then more importantly, thirdly, what, what techniques that I learned and strategies I learned along the way you can use to apply to your own goals and ambitions at the end of the line. One thing I don't want to talk about or repeat is that you often see talks from people saying, dream, believe, achieve, just do it, take the leap and you can be the best and quit your job today. And... I think that's lunacy. I think if you, if you just do that, you're probably going to end up in debt and have no job and be homeless. I think if you really put strategic plans in place, you may actually have a really good shot of doing what it is. I think uh, the best way I've heard it phrased by, is by someone else saying, if you, if you just say dream, believe, achieve, and you quote it from someone else, you may as well just be reading a stripper's Instagram. So, <laughs> so I'll start off with what I do. I create magic tricks. Um, and it's not what you think. When you see magicians on television, on stage, in theaters, or even at weddings and parties, they'll be performing tricks. And much like local musicians and bands, when you hear them, especially locally, they'll be playing cover songs. And that's essentially what happens in the magic realm is that magicians will perform tricks created by other people. And the way they learn these tricks is by buying them, usually from the internet or from books, brick and mortar stores. So in the real world, what, what actually happens when you make a good magic trick, you have to produce it like a product. So that will entail literally creating a product trailer that will show the trick being performed tell you the highlight points about the trick, why it's good. Then you'll have to um, make a physical product. So it might be a prop or a gimmick. And we, we work with manufacturers in China, Greece, Mexico, all over the world. Then you've got to brand the product and make beautiful packaging to make it jump off the shelves and make it look desirable. Then you've got to market the effect or the trick to make people in every corner of the globe actually get their eyes and want to see it. And you've got to use a whole other bunch of skills like networking to speak with influential magicians to get them to perform it on their television shows or on stage to build a desire in the buyer to make them want to purchase your work. How did I get into it? I was 15 years old. I, was, I had a punctured lung. I was laid up off my feet for nine months. And as a kid, my grandfather had showed me magic tricks. So I was bored. I was, wanted to do sports, couldn't get out of the house and started playing with some magic tricks. And I watched the television. There was a magician on TV, he did this awesome trick. And I wanted to do the same one. I started playing around. I came up with a way to do it. And I don't know why, but I filmed the video and I put it on the internet. And about three days later, a man from England messaged me and offered me 500 pounds for the intellectual property rights to that trick. Now, 15 years old, a man from England messaged you, offering you 500 pounds for something you've been playing with in your bedroom. I thought I was getting groomed. <laughs> yeah, literally, I was like, okay. <laughs> but it, it was genuine. And he wrote me a message. And it was really pivotal for me. And he said to me, uh, first of all, congratulations. That was, he liked it. And he said, uh, he'd, he'd been in magic a long time. He'd never seen that trick done that way before. So whatever I, the way I'd done it was different and not seen before. And he said, maybe you might have a knack for this and you should probably carry on. And I was like, okay, maybe there's a, a world out there for people like me who sit in their bedrooms making tricks up, not even doing them. But I started to delve deeper into the internet and I found out that there's a select few uh, people, about a dozen around the world that actually did this for a living. They would travel to different countries, creating magic tricks for, mag for magicians, not even performing them, just creating them. I thought, oh, I really, I really like that. I want to do that. I wanted a piece of that pie. I love pie, obviously. So, <laughs> so I, 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 I took a look at how they got there or what I needed to do to get there. And in short, there's big magic companies and they would buy tricks off people that would send them to them. So thousands of, there are thousands of people trying to do this. They would all send their tricks in and maybe one or two would slip through the net and become sort of somewhat successful until the next week, the flavor of the week's done, and somebody else would be in the spotlight. And I didn't really see that as a, as a long-term feasible way of actually doing this for the rest of my life. I looked at then the wider broad spectrum of the people who were doing it full-time, and the ones that had a fan base and longevity and were continually uh, getting their tricks on television and on screen. And what I realized is that exactly as I spoke about what the job is that I entail, they had this whole building block behind them, every, lots of building blocks behind them, being all their videos were stellar, their branding was second to none, they had great social skills, all their social media was on point and they had a big reach, all their products were the best made, they were, had fine attention to detail. And I figured if I was going to do this long term, I'd have to do that. The one thing different between the people in the US and the other parts of the world that were the full package, the dozen or so really doing it, all their lives, is that they were based in sort of multimedia hubs and hotspots around the world, San Francisco, LA, New York, uh, London, and 
I was 15 in Porth Call. I had no money and my friends <laughs> hated my magic. <laughs> One in the crowd, he's going down. <laughs> but I had nothing. So it was like, what am I going to do? And I realized like, pretty quickly that I understood that if I was going to do it, I had to be entirely self-sufficient. So I put a plan in place. I was going to go to college. I went to Progen College four years and studied a national diploma in multimedia and a, a higher national diploma in design for interactive multimedia. And that gave me a four-year series of courses that give me a foundation on, on pretty much everything I needed. It was almost like it was tailor-made just for me, but it was video production, editing, design, branding, marketing, teaching me about corporate identity and, and even, even the basics of uh, networking and being professional in a, in, a, in a realm that I certainly wasn't used to. I did the course. When I was on the course, I designed a deck of playing cards. I did some Photoshop work and I designed this deck of playing cards and with help from a friend, Owen, we funded and made, we printed 2,500 decks. Now, just to give it a bit of perspective, uh, only the, at the time, only the big US companies were really printing custom decks of cards. So for a solo entity to do it, like in an isolated part of Wales, it was unheard of. And then I read a book and it, was, it changed my life. It was called How to Win Friends and Influence People by Dale Carnegie. A few of you have probably read it in the room. And that book basically it tries to teach you like the gift of the gab, but also the value and importance of networking and having good social skills can push you further up the corporate industry ladder. And it teaches you in a way to simplify. It. It's like sometimes the most, the most successful people in an industry may not be the most skilled at what they do, but they have incredible skills in networking and socializing. They can schmooze and schmam people or whatever it is. So I read this book and I have my deck of cards printed. It's called Moonshine Deck. This is the last one in existence because they've sold out. And we, I, I went to the world's largest magic convention, 20,000 magicians, and I basically schmoozed my way into a magic distrib distributor, and I sold my deck of cards to them wholesale. I continued on then really quickly. Instead of uh, just letting them sell it, I continued to network with people and reach out to other people around the world to get the cards in the hands of magicians on television, on the internet, in front of influential people. And within a short space of time, uh, I not just sold out of the first run, I sold out of three runs, 7,500 decks in the first 12 months and it was gone. So I was left then with a bit of profit and I had two options, Magaluf for a week with the boys <laughs> <laughs> or to reinvest, or re reinvest it in myself. So I did, I reinvested, I bought a studio set of cameras, gear, rigs, desktop computers, everything. I finally self-produced a trailer. I worked with manufacturers in China and in Greece and developed a physical product. I designed the packaging and branding myself, put it all together, and then contacted a US company and networked with them to buy the trick off me. So I just cut away all the competition and just went direct with a full product. So I said to them, oh, uh, you know, if you, if you need anyone in the, on the British side of the, the world to do some video work for you or, or some, uh, some logo design and branding, give me a shout. And I started kept up talking to them and eventually they did. They gave me a load of freelance work. And within a couple of weeks, I was pretty much just producing full products for this company, one after another, just the whole package. So they weren't even involved, but I was doing it from freelance and they quickly figured it was quicker to employ me than it was to keep me on a freelance. And then the next thing, four years later, I've like traveled all over the world for them making tricks. And like, it's the weirdest one I've found as a statistic. I Googled myself. <laughs> Definitely, yeah, you all done it. My tricks, I did this in the research for this, my tricks have been performed on TV and on the internet and seen by over 150 million people around the world. It's mental, isn't it? <laughs> I don't even look at myself in the mirror a hundred times in my life. So that's all well and good. Enough of a massage of my own ego. How does this apply to you? So the first thing I sort of want to dispel, because I see a lot of social media and a lot of people sharing these videos that are all inspirational. A dream job is a real job. Like you see people sailing on yachts and they just say the money rolls into the bank. I work really hard. I have long nights, early mornings. And if you believe, if you think that you're going to go off and do your dream job and just quit tomorrow and just go and live on a yacht and just become a millionaire, you're not going to do it. And it's not going to stay that way. If you do really have ambition and you do want to go off and create your own dream job or, or start a business, do it in increments. Start, about, start with your baseline. So if you've got a nine to five job, don't even think about leaving it until you can reach your baseline. So your baseline is a simple concept. It's just your rent, your bills, your food, that, all your monthly, out, monthly outgoings. Once you can confidently meet, meet your baselines consistently, when you do leave your nine to five job, you've got all this free time to then capitalize on it and start making yourself a comfortable wage. With that in mind and thinking about if you do have a dream job, maybe you want to open up a restaurant, 
just having a good recipe isn't, isn't good enough these days. You're not going to cut it. Maybe one in a thousand will, but I don't think that it's the right approach to take. It's like the, that's like the X factor approach of, oh, it's so good, everyone's going to eat it. If you go off and maybe do a, a culinary business course, even something like, which applies to me, like photography or branding, and even a social media course, you can understand that you almost become a sort of Swiss army knife and the master of your own destiny. If you, if you open up a restaurant and you understand the way it works and you're not pay, paying people to come up with marketing promotions to get people off the street on a quiet night, you understand to do it yourself, then even if it fails, then you've still succeeded because the, the restaurant may go under for whatever reason, but you can start again the following day with the same skills that you've learned. Or you can diversify like I did and go into different areas that you found that you really enjoy. You may, you may enjoy the, the, the negotiating on prices for your ingredients. You may love that and help other companies do it. So by diversifying your skill set, becoming a Swiss army knife of your own industry, you can either, you can't lose. You either win or you learn. That makes sense. So uh, I wasn't going to do any magic on stage because, I, like I said, I create magic for a living. But let's get some volunteers on stage. We have three. One at the back, someone else. Two, let's get you on stage. This is Jed. <laughs> I see your name thing on the card. I'm not, I'm not a medalist. I'm one more, one more. One more, come on. Need one more person, don't be shy. Come on then, on the corner, let's go. Oh, go on, then you come upstage. Let's diversify. <laughs> Perfect, how you doing, guys? Oh, Steve. <laughs> Jed, yeah. you got your mic, how you doing, man? Yeah, I'm not a mind reader, I've just seen the name tag on the floor. <laughs> Hi, how you doing, what's your name? Felicity. Felicity, nice to meet you. So um, I want to say by Steve, I have met Steve before. This wasn't part of the plan. No, no, no. But it's just one thing that we haven't set anything up in advance because this would not play out right if there was anyone believe that this was predetermined uh, by the people on stage. I'm going to ask you to think of a number between 1 and 100. On my phone, I've got a notes app, and you can verify this and testify for the audience. Yeah. Think of a number between 1 and 100 and change your mind a few times. When you're happy, tell everyone what it is. Okay. Happy? Yeah. What is it? 27. 27. Do you want to change your mind? No. Nope. You can verify we haven't set this up in advance. Nope. Brilliant. So watch, on my notes, you can, you can verify where is it? Uh, uh, random words. Go through and look at the word at 27 and just memorize it. Okay. Yeah, press yeah. the home button. It's not on there. And then just say it over and over to yourself a few times in your head. That word. Say it over and over to yourself a few times as you don't forget it. Perfect? Yeah. Got that? Yeah. All right, no yeah. pressure. It's all on you. Yeah. Now I'm see. Uh, next time when you do one quick thing, just type in three numbers in the calculator, hit times. It doesn't matter if I see it. I've seen this one before. Press times and pass it to Jed. Jed, how's it going, man? Yeah, good. <laughs> we haven't met before. This is not set up. Thank you. Sorry, nope. Steve. Um, I haven't told you to put anything in this phone or anything like this. This, is, this, wouldn't be, this would be pointless if it was set up. Yeah. <laughs> Type in exactly like Steve did, three numbers, and then press the times button, if you could. Perfect. Press times. And then pass on to Felicity. Felicity? I don't even know. Is that a real name? Felicity? Um, it's a stutter. Felicity. I've had many versions. So really <laughs> Felicity. Use. Felicity. You're on stage with us. This time, is quite common. Facility. <laughs> help facilitize, facilitate this trick. Right. Could you type in three numbers and instead of pressing times, this time just press equals. Just type in three times. Any three numbers. It doesn't matter. Perfect. So that was two numbers, but you hit times and it's got up a big result. Oh. That's okay. Right. Can you very ca carefully and slowly, word, number by number, read that number out loud? 401-719-410. And just show everyone what it is. So just sort of keep that in mind. I'll make sure those numbers are not going to change. They're different. And just understand that if... <laughs> you're smiling at me. <laughs> just understand that if any one of you had typed in a different number in a different position or a different way, and when you hit times, it would be a completely different result. Perfect, and this wasn't set up in advance. I'm going to come back to you in a minute. If you guys could just stand to the side. And Steve, you can just stand here. You remember that word in your head? Yeah. All right, so you've all noticed the big plaques on stage. I'm going to start with this first one over here. Don't say what the word is out loud, because okay. <laughs> this hasn't gone like the best in practice. But just with either a yes or a no, I want you to confirm whether this is your word. So hold on to this. No. Million percent. Million percent. Are you sure? Yeah. <laughs> all right. Stay there. Ah, William. Forgot this. Yeah. Stay standing for a second. Yeah. <laughs> That's all right. It's okay. That was a critical moment gone wrong. <laughs> all right. So we'll bring it back. Uh, Phyllis, you have the numbers in front of you. The phone's gone off. It's gone off. It's my bank card. 
<laughs> can I make money disappear from my account? Yeah, that's the number. You can yeah. just see these numbers there. If you hold the microphone. Okay. Go to the second flat. It's all off the shop right now. I'm going to turn this around. In a nice loud voice. When I say go, I want you to read the numbers out of your Okay. Four zero one seven one nine four one zero. Take a seat for me, please. I'll yeah. that later. So this was all done with zero presentation. This was basically how a magician would sort of blindly run through a trick, and there's a reason for this, and I wanted to highlight it right now. If you're going to go off and just do something and hope for the best, then the numbers wouldn't work. In this case, they did. If I went off and blindly had the, the, the word remembered <laughs> and it was wrong, it would end up like this. So this is result number one, which is wrong, which is blind faith. Result number two, and I'll tell you why result number two brings this all back to full circle. Every move and action and word that I've spoken on this stage today was a strategic plan from the moment I started writing the speech to the very last minute of speaking to you on stage today. You may remember a phrase that I mentioned earlier or a name that I spoke, and it'll become relevant in just a moment. Because I planned this out in such a way and made sure that I was in control of every element and facet of this talk, I was hoping that there'd be a determined, definitive outcome that would be exactly what I wanted it to be. <laughs> half of it's right, half of it's wrong, or so it seems. So I'm going to ask you nice and loudly to say your word right now. Ambition. Ambition. Okay. I said that every word that I spoke was meant to make sh ensure that this would happen. I was trying to influence you. I said a name, and I think it's never been more apt than now, that if, but just by putting strategies and goals in place, you need one extra thing. And it's exactly what Steve said. It's ambition. I'm so glad you didn't pick light bulb or box. <laughs> <laughs> it's ambition. And I mentioned Dylan Thomas earlier, ladies and gentlemen. In the words of Dylan Thomas, I've every strategy you want in place, but without ambition, none of this is possible, Dylan Thomas. Uh